right, so I have one after and right, so first some announcements. Um, so the problem set is available and it is a two week assignment. So a week from Thursday. I guess one other important announcement is that um, there will be no lecture next Monday. Our infamous squint workshop is happening, and many of us, including myself, will be on uh, our travel. Um, so we'll have a big Uh, right. <clears throat> Very good. Anybody have any issues uh, on the website or anything else? Okay. Very good. All right. So, last time we were reviewing some things uh, in our that lit the lay the foundation for a discussion we're going to have for many weeks now about so-called continuous variable quantum optics. So in thinking about the quantized field, uh, there are different ways that we think about the quantum degrees of freedom. We think about the particles, we think about the waves, and there are quantum aspects of the waves that are unique uh, and not describable by the classical physical description. Well, we'll see what those things are, what we mean by that, make that more precise. So to lay that groundwork, just there's a bunch of algebra that we use all the time, so which you're practicing already in your homework, reviewing it just quickly, review here. So, uh, a central uh, player in the discussion here are the quadratures of the field. They're quantized quadratures satisfying the chemical commutation relations. Okay. Uh, the quadratures represent the components of the oscillator. So if we have some oscillator that is oscillating at frequency omega, then there is always a component that is oscillating uh, as cosine relative to some phase and some component that's oscillating like sine. And quantum mechanically, those components of the oscillator don't commute with one another. Okay. For a particle in a well, they are proportional to the position of momentum. Here they represent the, quad, or the general quadratures of the oscillator. Okay? So one of the things we reminded ourselves is that we, this operator, this unitary operator generated by the number operator is the operator that rotates you in phase space. Okay? And it rotates, in this case, clockwise because we always measure the angle according to the positive right-hand rule. So that's why it's either the minus i, uh, because it's rotating in that direction. Um, right. So for an arbitrary angle, we call that the rotation operator. And the unitary transformation on the annihilation operator is this. It's an example. The time evolution is an example of such a rotation. Now, I just wanted to correct something I said incorrectly last lecture about the sign. So if you look at the rotation, how this transformation acts on x, it is this. Okay. Okay. And that operator is because in some sense this is a passive, it's always the difference between passive and active rotations. These are what happens to the coordinates x and p. So we're rotating the axes this way, okay? While that would say, that would give us the right components 
or if I fixed the axis and I actively rotated the vector the other way. So these operators, x with a label on it, in this case theta and p theta, are also quadratures. They're the phase, what we call sometimes phase quadratures. And again, what this represents, it's important to understand what this means physically, is I could, with a little bit of trickery here, rewrite the time evolution as an amount of cosine and amount of sine relative to some phase. Okay? So they are the quadratures relative to some reference phase. Here, the reference phase was zero. Okay. So they represent these uh, axes in phase space. All right. Um, right. Another important algebraic uh, player in this whole business is the displacement operator, the phase space displacement operator. which displaces us both in position and momentum, and we often write that, and we like to write it in terms of the complex amplitudes, and there's all kinds of algebra. We're going to see a whole bunch of this, as I say, over the course of the next few weeks, a lot of it. Um, so there's all kinds of relations, like, for example, how we use baker campbell hausdorff to write that as equivalent to a normal ordered product, et cetera. Importantly, the phase space displacement operator is something which does exactly that. Under a unitary transformation, we displace in the complex plane by alpha. So we displace the real part by the real part of alpha and the imaginary part by the imaginary part of alpha. And the um, coherent states are obtained as a displacement on the vacuum. Okay. So that's the vacuum in phase space, and this is the coherent state. And this is the way the time evolution goes. The coherent state stays a coherent state and rotates in phase space as such. Okay, it's the free evolution. So uh, these operators all preserve coherent states. So uh, the displacement operator and the rotation operator take coherent states to coherent states. You could say they preserve the, if I start with classical field, so if I had any classical state, which would be a statistical mixture of coherent states, then these operations, free evolution and displacements, would preserve the classicality. Okay? These, these are examples of what we talked about a little bit at the end of last semester in homework, this is, these are examples, and we'll talk about more of this as linear optics. So the linear optical elements for on a single mode would be, the only things we could do would be to phase shift the mode, which is the rotation operator. This is a, a phase shifter. It's one thing we could do for the mode. We could put it through a piece of glass, and that would give us a phase shift. Or we can uh, mix it some way. We can displace the amplitude. That's also a linear operation. We'll discuss that a little bit more today. And we would preserve classic, the classicality. Okay. All right. Now, we started to discuss last lecture going beyond here when we were talking about squeeze states. And a squeeze state of light is any state of light such that for 
there exists some quadrature such that this is less than the vacuum level. So if the variance of the fluctuations along any quadrature are less than that of the vacuum, then we say the state is squeezed. Okay. And as we discussed, there is no state which is a statistical mixture of coherent states. This is this such a state is non-classical, I'll put that in quotes because this is a very subtle point, in the following uh, precise way. That is to say that rho does not equal a statistical mixture of coherent states, where this is a positive probability distribution. So there is no way we can make such a state thinking about as being radiated by classical currents. And in that sense, this state is not classical. Okay? Um, so if a, a pure state is squeezed. That implies that this is a minimal uncertainty product. Okay, so that means for one of these guys, it's bigger than a half. The other guy, it's less than a half, and the product of these is a half. Okay, actually, one, one of them is less than the square root of two. The other one's less than one. Yeah, is this distinct from what we normally call pure state? I'm not saying that this is a pure state. I'm saying if it's a, it's squeezed and it's pure then it must satisfy. So not all pure states satisfy this. Okay. Clearly, there are many pure states which are not minimum uncertainty states, right? For example, the n equals one Fox state of a harmonic oscillator is not a minimum uncertainty state. Okay. But uh, if it's squeezed and it's pure, then it satisfies this. All right. Um, so let's, for example, an example of that would be a state I would I might write for. I typically take say the x state for example. Here's a state which is squeezed in along the x quadrature and anti-squeezed along the position quadrature. Okay? Now this parameterization in writing the scale factor in terms of the exponential parameter is a convention because of the, nat as we'll see, a natural way uh, that um, we obtain squeeze states. Okay? Um, so, in phase space, we would say that a squeeze state, for example, that of this sort would be one that has its uncertainty bubble that is distorted in this way, where this was the vacuum. then this guy is squeezed with a variance or an RMS, which is e to the minus r over root 2. Okay. So this little phase space diagram represents a squeeze state, which is squeezed along the x quadrature. Okay. Um, now, as we were discussing, we can think, we often think about uh, different cases. I might, for example, look at a state that looks like this, where the squeezing is 
along the I should have made one down here. Anyway. That kind of state is what's called an amplitude squeeze state. Alternatively, I might have a state which looks like this. This is called a phase we state. This is called an amplitude squeeze state because my uncertainty on the amplitude of this phaser is reduced below what it would be for the vacuum level. I have a better certainty of what the amplitude is. Of course, in this case, I have less certainty in what its phase is. In other words, when this crosses, if I ask when is there a node in the field, I have less certainty in that, right? Because when this thing crosses the x-axis, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty there. Okay. On the contrary, this state has a better, has a not a very well defined amplitude comparatively to the vacuum level. But it has a better defined phase in the sense of when this crosses the x-axis, when it's a node, I will be able to determine that pretty well. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. So um, I can also think about of course, this is the vacuum, but I could have a state that looked like this, for example. Oops. Is that what color I'm using? This kind of state is called squeeze vacuum. called vacuum because the mean field of this state is zero. So in that sense, it's a vacuum, but it has quadratures that are not distributed in the same way as the normal vacuum. It has reduced uncertainty in this case along the x quadrature at the initial time and increased along the p quadrature. So let's, what, is the, what are these different things? How do we think about that? Well, I, as I tried to do last time, and I'll try again now, maybe using my um, So here is my picture. Let's look at. Let's start with, I want to just start with, to start, let me just get rid of this and let's say I have a coherent state. And now what I want to sketch over here is some picture of what is the um, amplitude doing as a function of time. Well, classically, if I thought about the phaser, this thing is undergoing some kind of harmonic oscillation, right? That's the mean field. But on top of that, there are these fluctuations. The fluctuations, which are the projection of that bubble onto the x-axis, will be the same no matter what time, right? As this thing rotates around in the, in the phase plane, the projection of that bubble onto the x-axis will be the same. That's not to say it's going to be, it's just going to say that the 
variance and the fluctuations will be the same, right? So, you know, I'll have, what I'll actually see is some kind of, on my photo detector that somehow measures X, and we'll get to that later, I'll see some noise on that, but the noise variance here, if I were to look at sort of the one over so this fuzz bubble is one over the square root of two at all times okay at any and for any phase quadrature the initial phase quadrature the phase quadrature associated with this they're all the same the noise is equally distributed as in all phases so this is for the coherence state Noise variance independent of the phase, okay, the phase of this oscillation. What about this guy? What would that look like? Sorry, does it matter how many photons are in our field for the one over root two? Is that for vacuum or for for two photons or any number of photons? Um, for any number of photons, the, the, the variance in this case. So delta x squared here, for that coherent state, it's the same vacuum level, no matter what the mean field is. Okay. Now, you may be thinking, and we'll get to this, about homodidine detection and how the number of photons in the field affects the measurement. But calibrated in this way, this fluctuation level is independent of the mean field. It's always the same if it's a coherent state. Okay. All right, so now let's look at this next one and have the same uh, picture here of the oscillation as a function of time. That's the mean field. But well, what about the fluctuations in that guy? Okay. Well, in this case, at this point, I'm not going to draw, I'm just going to draw the, the envelope of the, the variance. When I'm at that phase here, when this, I have a very well defined, uh, in this case, when this crosses the axis, say it's along, at when that axis becomes P, which is at the maximum here, I have the minimum uncertainty, right? On the other hand, when this thing crosses at, uh, at the node of this thing, well, now I, then I have a very big variance at that point. Okay. So my noise, uh, and then it's small again. So let's see how I can draw this. It looks kind of like very bad at drawing this. So I have lots of noise here, little noise here, lots of noise here, little noise here. <coughs> Lots of noise here, <coughs> noise here. Okay. So it's got little noise at the peaks and lots of noise there. That is an amplitude squeeze state. I can try my best again to do this thing for the case where now I have a situation where I have little uncertainty here and a lot of uncertainty here. Okay? That kind of state has an envelope that looks <coughs> easier to draw.
So now I have lots of noise here, and then little noise here, and then lots of noise here, and then little noise here, and then lots of noise here. That is a phase squeeze state. I can ask, what about if I had the vacuum? And I ask, what is the quarter, the quadrature in the vacuum? Well, the vacuum is not an eigenstate of the X operator, right? It has uncertainty, which means the quadrature on this guy, if I were to ask, what I'm going to have is vacuum noise. And the vacuum noise is going to be the same at all is supposed to be the same thickness of that, although I didn't draw it. Okay, so this thing is 1 over root 2. This is the vacuum. And finally, I have, for the example I drew over there, squeeze vacuum, okay, which has a kind of uh, uncertainty bubble lots of noise here, and then less noise there, and then lots of noise here, and then less noise here, etc. So this, at this particular quadrature, this is e to the minus r over root 2, and this is e to the plus r. And so the noise is varying as a function of the phase structure. Yes? So I guess I'm a little confused on the drawings in the phase diagram. Uh -huh. So for a squeezed vacuum, uh -huh. if you imagine the center of mass is in place of the bubble, but then it's rotating. Exactly. So we, the way we should think about these pictures is that we have an ensemble of phasers. Okay. So for example, this picture says I have either this phaser or that phaser or that phaser or that. Okay. Each one of those occurs with a certain probability. Say it's a Gaussian distribution with the peak here. Each one of those phasers is going around at angular frequency omega. And then I'm asking what is the projection on the x-axis as a function of time? Sampling from that distribution of different possible phasers. And when I do that, I get this picture. Right? Because it's going to be, on average, it's going to be that black curve. But sometimes it's above, sometimes it's below. This is a particular shot. Right? If I were to run my experiment again, with it prepared the same quantum state, I'm not going to get the same deterministic wiggly curve, but it will be distributed, if I were to make a histogram, it would be distributed with a Gaussian distribution, as we will see, of different points in that axis. Okay. Similarly here, with my best attempt, not, not as good as it could be, because at that point, this guy, when it crosses the x-axis, it has the minimum uncertainty. Okay, that's when it's at its maximum peak, and that's this guy is supposed to be less than this. But when it goes to zero, I have much bigger uncertainty. Okay. The same for the vacuum. 
the vacuum I can think about as you know a distribution of many different initial phasers. You remember that you know we had a thermal state uh, had a Gaussian distribution here. Okay. Now we have to think about the degree to which I can. This is a we're kind of getting a little bit of our head of ourselves. The degree to which I can think about the vacuum itself as a Gaussian distribution of random waves. What the heck are you talking about, Deutsch? But we can, and we'll see that in a moment. Putting that mathematical question aside, if I measure x, and I don't even tell you yet experimentally how we do that, although you might be quite interested in that. Mathematically, we know I can just ask the following question. Given the vacuum, which we know is the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, how do I write, what is the probability of seeing a particular x? Well, that's just this, right? By quantum mechanics. And what is that? Well, that's the wave function of the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, right? Square, which is what? It's a Gaussian with a width that in these units of one half, right? This is e to the minus x to delta x zero squared with some normalization where delta x zero squared is a half. So I have a probability distribution which is a Gaussian and now I'm drawing a Gaussian distribution that's what I would see. I'm not telling you yet how you actually do that in the lab. I'm just saying that's what quantum mechanics says the answer should be. It's not a deterministic answer. It's a random outcome sampled from that distribution. Finally, for the case of the squeeze vacuum, again, it's the same, it's a distribution of random phasers all going around with this kind of Gaussian, but it's not a symmetric Gaussian anymore. In other words, the covariance matrix in X and P is not a circle. It's an ellipse with its different sizes. Now, I ask you, although I kind of somewhat telegraphed it, but not precisely because my artistic skills are much too much left to be desired, what is the frequency or period of this breathing of the noise? If the frequency of the oscillator is omega, what is the frequency of this breathing? Two omega. Two omega. Why do you say that? stretched out so you can't tell the top. That's right. So this thing has half, because of this symmetry, it has half the period of the oscillator itself, right? So these things oscillate at two omega. And this is, this period is pi over omega, where this period is pi over two omega. Very good. All right. So that's just some qualitative pictures. We want to now get under the hood and talk about the mathematics. Uh, I'm listening. So, uh, when we think of the amplitude squeeze state, yes. Uh, should you think of the squeezing uh, a little bent because it should be uh, circular? No. I mean, so. This is, that's a different kind of squeeze state, but it's not, a, it's not this particular, that's not a, the minimum uncertainty squeeze state. So one can talk about number squeezing, which is something which would have a more banana-like form, 
have a constant amplitude, but this is just a definition. We call an amplitude squeeze state a squeeze state, which is that of that pure form whose quadrature that squeezed is along the phase of the mean field. That's just a definition. Now it has operational meaning, as we will see in a moment. But that is just the definition. And it is not a banana. It's got that. We'll see bananas in the homework sometime soon. OK. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the squeezing algebra. So we can obtain squeeze states as a unitary transformation of vacuum. Any two states, of course, in Hilbert space, pure states are connected by a unitary transformation. But the specific one we're talking about is, so let me def define uh, what is called the squeezing operator. S as a function of, in this case, a real parameter R is going to be defined as e to the, the exponential one half R a squared minus R a dagger squared. I can never remember the sign. Okay. So that's a, just a definition. Um, notice that this operator doesn't conserve photon, but it involves creation annihilation of <coughs> pairs of photons, or right, two photons. Come back to that later. So this kind of operator cannot be obtained through linear optics. So let's look at the properties. This operator is unitary. How do you see that? <coughs> yes. Yeah, exponent is anti-hermitian. Exactly. Its exponent is anti-hermitian, right? This is e to the i times a hermitian operator, because the dagger of this is negative itself. Okay. All right. So, uh, what I'm interested in is the unitary transformation of this operator on the annihilation operator. Yes. Yeah. R real here? R is real for the moment. So how would you calculate that if you don't know the answer? BCH. Sorry? BCH formula? That's right. I use the BCH formula. And so we remember always e to the a, I write this operator as, con that's a conjugation by that kind of similarity transformation. This is equal to the sum over n. the multiple commutator of this with this n times, right? So my little notation here is I commute a little a with a zero times, one time, two times, three times, etc. right? So this is one plus a plus one over two factorial a with a a plus 1 over 3 factorial A with A with A with A. Right. Everyone knows that formula. Should be A, right? It's the right term. Sorry? The first term should be A, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Sheila. Very important. Okay, so 
we just need to do those commutators. Luckily, we don't have to do an infinite number of them. We see a recursion formula pretty damn quick. So, um, in this case, A is minus this, because I have S dagger over here, right? And so that's equal to R over 2 A dagger squared minus A squared. It's the minus of the exponent there, right? I wrote S. And so, because I've got to keep track of these damn minus signs, I hate that, but that's life. Um, so, uh, the annihilation operator commuted with this is equal to r over 2, the annihilation operator commuted with a dagger squared, which is minus 2 times a dagger. Right? because I had to them out twice. Uh, there's a plus one. No, that's a plus. What the heck did I do? Why are you commuting them in that order? Yeah. Good, that's why it's wrong. Thank you. Because I'm hungry, that's why. <laughs> okay, it's not thinking quite right. Well, there's good excuse in the book. Very good. And so if I do it again, transformation is known by the person who first wrote it down to our knowledge of Bogo Liubov transformation. Bogolyubov. Bogolyubov studied this first in the context of looking at superfluid helium and the same kind of operations, this kind of unitary that resulted from a certain Hamiltonian came around thinking about elementary excitations in superfluid helium, but we've absorbed it in quantum optics and taken it as our own. 
Now, is the Bouguiouf transformation has a sort of relationship to the Lorentz transformation? Because it looks like a rotation with respect to an imaginary angle. So you know about Lorentz boots have a similar. There's an intimate relationship between the group of Lorentz transformations, as we'll see, as the group of squeezing. That's just a mathematical relation. Nothing physically deep about that, to my opinion. Um, A, a point just to notice. In linear optics, we saw that you know the annihilation operator just mapped map back to itself. It's a, a, a phase shifters or beam splitters. Whereas here, A's and A daggers are mixed together through the squeezing parameter. All right. So what is the unitary trans this unitary transformation on the quadratures, say particularly x? So that is the transformation on A plus the transformation on A dagger over root 2. So we just plug that in. I like when I'm working with these things, it's convenient to write a little shorthand. I'll call this script DC and this script DS. So I don't have to write out Koch and Sitch all the time. Okay? So this is equal to Koch A minus Sitch A dagger plus Koch A dagger minus Sitch A over So this is equal to cosh minus cinch times a plus a dagger over a two. Right? And what is cosh minus cinch? Well, remember that cosh of a parameter is e to the r plus e to the minus r over 2, and cinch is e to the r minus e to the minus r over 2, right? So this is equal to e to the minus r x. And similarly, this is e to the plus r x. That's why we parameterize our squeezing in this way. By the way, often this parameter r is known as the squeezing parameter. is it related to uh, the electricity if you were to kind of add the uh, okay. Okay. logarithm of some kind? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But we'll come back to that in a moment in a certain way. How do we actually measure squeezing? In a very unfortunate way, but we do it. Um, um, right. Um, so, uh, for example, I can look at the, let me define the action of this operator on the vacuum as, the, this is what I'm going to call squeeze vacuum. Okay. So I took, this is some 
pure state that I obtained uh, applying this squeezing operator to this. Is this squeeze vacuum? Meaning, <coughs> is it something which uh, is exactly this, the picture that I drew over here? How would we tell? Well, we want to calculate what, first of all, what is the mean field? How would we calculate that? This is the kind of tricks of the trade we use all the time. Well, we just plug this in. The, the squeeze vacuum is itself a unitary map on the vacuum. So uh, this is then this, right? But what is that? So that's the Bogliubov transformation, right? So this is equal to the Koch term A minus the Singe term A dagger. But what is that? It's zero. How do you see that? Well, A acts on me, this guy gives zero, but A dagger acts on that guy gives zero. So this is nothing. So it's, the mean field is zero, and therefore it is vacuum. By what, how we're calling that, or something whose mean field at all times, and if I look at this at any time, the mean field is zero. Therefore, we call it a vacuum like thing. Okay. Um, what about. Uh, the fluctuations, well also, this is also implies, of course, that in the vacuum, the mean of the quadratures is also zero, because they are, a dagger also has mean zero for exactly the same calculation. Therefore, the quadratures in the vacuum have mean value zero, right? Yes? Is the sine of R what determines if we're squeezing along X or P? So by definition here, the, the answer is yes, but typically we would take R to be positive. So we're going to talk more generally about squeezing along any quadrature in a moment, whether it's amplitude, phase, or X or P or anything. In this case, I'm going to take R to be, we're restricting our attention to the case where R is positive. then uh, this is squeezed along x for exactly the reason that you said over here. And we see that formally by uh, looking at the fluctuations in the quadratures since this is then equal to this because the mean of x itself is 0. And then how would we calculate this? Well, we do the unitary transformation. And we use the tricks of the trade that I, for a unitary operator, I can bring it inside any polynomial in this way, right? Because I would have had x squared with the s, but I skipped a step. And I brought the s inside here. Why was I allowed to do that? Because it's unitary, right? I can stick in an S dagger S, and that's true. So this then is equal to e to the minus 2r, and that is a half. And similarly, so this is delta x squared, delta p squared, plus 2r in these parameters. Okay. And so for r positive, this is less than a half, <coughs> and this is greater than a half. Okay. 
Now, to one of your questions, Zach, here. Um, when one reports how much squeezing one has in an optical device, one typically does it in these are in an arcane way. One talks about how many dBs of squeezing we have. So we often write the amount of squeezing as the um, whatever quadrature, the minimum quadrature, so it could be x or it could be any one, relative to the vacuum level. And then we take 10 log base 10 of that. So that's the amount of squeezing in dBs. I hate you, power engineers. Um, so, uh, this of course, in these units here, this is equal to 10 times 2R times the log base 10 of E. Right? Which is something like, like what is 8 point something, 8.68 8 times R. So R of 1 is near 10B of squeezing, right? And R a little bigger than 1 is like 10B dB of squeezing. And 10 dB of squeezing represents a factor of 10 reduction in the fluctuations relative to the vacuum. And that's kind of state of the art. 10 dB of squeezing is kind of, it's not, we could do better now, but that's kind of, that was like a, a tough thing to do, to get 10 dB of squeezing. It's a factor of 10. And of course, the other direction, it blows up exponentially much bigger. All right, very good. Uh, so, As we were just discussing, how do we describe squeeze states which are squeezed along some other quadrature? So for example, I can think about a squeeze vacuum state, which is squeezed along this quadrature. Um, by that angle. So there is, oh, no, I have the other way around. Sorry. So here's my zero phase reference. This is some other phase reference. And I'm squeezed. So this is squeezed along the x phi quadrature. So this is still squeezed vacuum, but squeezed vacuum with respect. Right? So I can obtain this state by rotating by angle phi on the squeezing operator. Okay. This would be a squeezed vacuum along that phase quadrature. Now we sometimes put this all together, if I stick in an R dagger R over here, and of course the vacuum is unaffected by that, then I'm going to call this thing S as a function of zeta, everyone's favorite Greek letter to draw, on that, in the following way. So I will define S as a function of zeta as r dagger of phi s as a function of r r theta which is r phi e to the one half r a squared 
where minus r dagger, I'm sorry, r a dagger squared r phi. And then what? Well, I can play the same kind of trick I played with unitaries and throw these unitary operators into the exponent, right? Because u e to the a u is e to the u of a. Right? If you don't remember that, you can prove it to yourself pretty quickly. So this is equal to e to the one half r uh, r dagger a r square. Ooh, 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 ooh. I messed up. It's r and then r dagger on the other side. Doesn't matter, it's still true. But now I gotta put the dagger. This is equal to what? represents the amount of squeezing. And the direction of squeezing is determined by phi. So for example, if I, if I squeeze along the p quadrature, what is phi? Pi over two. Pi over two, right? So I'm squeezing along that quadrature. So Along that quadrature, phi is pi over 2. And so when it's pi over 2, this is minus 1. R would go to minus R. And indeed, as you suggested, making R go to minus R is enough to make you squeeze along the P. Okay. So that's the convention that I like to stick with. Right. Um, so, uh, suppose now I ask, what is the squeezing, what is the uncertainty along some other quadrature? So now I'm just picking some other quadrature, theta. And I want to know what are the fluctuations along this quadrature given this squeeze state. Okay. So once again, this is this state 
I would call also squeeze vacuum. This is squeezed vacuum, but squeezed along this quadrature. Okay. The case that we wrote down over here was squeezed vacuum squeezed along the x quadrature. This is squeezed along this quadrature. And that, the squeezing, the quadrature along which you squeeze just says at what phase in the oscillation is the uncertainty minimum. Right? Relative to some reference phase. So there's some reference phase that we're calling zero, and if it's squeezed along this quadrature, that means at uh, when the uh, phase of the oscillation is phi, the uncertainty is below the vacuum level by an amount e to the minus r, or 2r in variance. Okay? So I want to calculate. For this state, this squeeze vacuum state, what are what is the fluctuations along that quadrature? Okay, so the mean field is zero still. So I have to go through. The same, you know, I have to write this thing, I could write this in a lot of different ways. This is equal to the rotated x and then I have the squeezing operator And so what I will find when I do the tedious algebra is that this is equal to one half e to the minus two r cosine squared of phi minus theta plus e to the plus two r sine So as a function of the reference along which I'm looking, as a function of what theta I'm considering, when theta is equal to phi, I get the most squeezing. The fluctuations are the most below that. And at that, and when it's in quadrature, when that phase is 90 degrees different between phi, then I get the maximum fluctuations. So if I were to sketch these fluctuations as a function of look like as a function of theta. Well, they look like this. Where at some phi, the fluctuations are reduced below the vacuum level by a factor e to the minus 2r. And at this quadrature, 
the fluctuations are increased. So if we can measure the fluctuations in the quadrature as a function of some phase of something we're going to call the local oscillator, and we see on the spectrometer the noise variance varying as a function of the phase of the oscillator, it should vary in this cosinusoidal manner. And for some special choice of that, the noise will be below the vacuum level. And we say, yes, we have a space state. Okay. Um, finally, maybe I'll say, we'll see where we get. Uh, we can talk about the kinds of states that we talked about, which were, for example, amplitude or phase squeeze states. So this, I can talk about a state which I'll call alpha comma zeta, which is I apply the displacement operator to the squeezed vacuum. Okay. Note, this does not equal first displacing and then squeezing by that same amount. There is some other squeezing I can do. But we're going to take this as our definition. Because what this thing does is it takes, for example, the squeezed vacuum, for example, squeezed along the x quadrature, and displaces it like that. It takes the vacuum fluctuations associated with that state and displaces them to have a mean field. Okay. Um, you can easily see that this state has the same mean field as the coherent state with that same alpha. Why? Well, I can just look at, again, use the algebra here, do the displacement, and the mean thing in the, well, maybe I'll do it out, just what the heck. This is equal to Places this by that. And so this is equal to right? But this state, mathematically, much easier than doing it in the lab, I would apply an operator here where the quadrature here would be related to the direction here phi of that phasor, right? And I would squeeze along that quadrature. So I would choose my zeta parameter as equal to some r times the argument of that complex number to the, I'm sorry, e to the. And that would squeeze along that quadrature. Similarly, if I wanted a phase squeeze state, I would just have to shift 
shift that by the pi, and then I put a minus sign there. Okay. Very good. All right. For the first time in history, it's 12.15. I'm going to quit. Exactly. Get myself something to eat and uh, get my brain in here again. Um, so, where we're headed. Uh, this is the mathematical description of the squeeze state of a single mode. Okay. In your homework, you're, for example, looking at the squeeze state associated with two modes. To do that, you're going to use the same kind of algebra that we used here, but now, you know, you've been camera house work and all of that, but now with the two modes. That tells us something about the mathematical description of what these states are in Hilbert space and their properties to some degree. What we're going to talk about tomorrow, I mean tomorrow meaning next lecture, is how do we actually measure these things that I tried to draw. How do we measure squeezing? It's not photon counting, exactly, because we're measuring not the photon number distribution, but the quadratures. So we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to measure those quadratures? And then where we're headed from there is, well, OK, how would we actually create such a squeeze state? Uh, if we can't do it from a classical light source. So we need to go, in fact, this uh, form of the squeezing operator, which we can think about as unitary time evolution associated uh, with the radiation of the field, involves not independent creation annihilation of photons, but photons create an annihilation in pairs. And that is associated with a nonlinear optical process. So what we're going to talk about going forward is the relationship between nonlinear optics and the creation of non-classical light. All right? Very good. Bon appetit.